Catholic liturgical discipline in a former age indicated that sermons were not to be given at requiem masses, at funeral requiem masses. Not in the normal way that a sermon would be given. Part of this uh, injunction against sermons at a requiem funeral mass was for the purpose of uh, avoiding, it would seem, the temptation of eulogizing the deceased. The church has never um, promoted the idea of eulogizing the deceased because it is fraught with too many difficulties in the grief of losing a loved one we desire the loved one to be as we say in a better place well what is the uh, better place of course is to be with god this leads us then to put ourselves in a position to be the judge of the deceased which is really trying to take God's place. We are not uh, in God's place. We are not capable of judging. We are not even close to being capable of judging. Therefore, we should never presume to do so even out of an abundance of goodwill or a supposed act of charity, whereby we would want to proclaim that someone is indeed happy with God in heaven. That as an expression of our good wishes, perhaps, would be a thing to say, um, but it would only be that. I wish that the deceased is in heaven with God. Absolutely. I pray that the deceased is in heaven with God, absolutely. But we often say more than that, don't we? The deceased is with God in heaven. I judge that this is her rightful place or his rightful place. Presuming to do God's job, presuming to have the wisdom in order to do, job, to do God's job is um, a scary place to put oneself in actual fact. Therefore, we do not eulogize. We do not presume to judge. Our duty is to pray. Our duty is to pray for the deceased, and that is what we do in uh, the Holy Requiem Mass. We pray for the deceased. We pray... Uh, in a way which is infused with the theology of the church. We pray at one and the same time with great confidence in the mercy of God. We also pray at the same time, though, with a certain trepidation, not because of God, but because of ourselves. Because God is infinitely above us. What that means is, is that not only is his mercy infinitely more than we can anticipate it being, it is also the case that his justice is infinitely more than we can anticipate it being. Therefore, we do not presume uh, to judge. What we are doing then is praying with great confidence, but also the trepidation due to our own uh, weakness, due to our own failures, due to our own uh, sinfulness, due to our own lack of sight, our lack of sight into our own um, our own uh, opposition to God and his holy will. <clears throat> we believe in two judgments. We believe in a particular judgment and a general judgment. The particular judgment, we believe, happens immediately at the moment of death. This particular judgment is uh, made necessary because the, the soul has entered eternity 
the will of the soul entering eternity is fixed. There is going to be no more to judge. And so therefore the particular judgment takes place because uh, the freedom to um, the freedom to choose good or evil in the vicissitudes of uh, earthly life has come to an end. The will now is fixed in eternity, and therefore a judge of one's eternal of one's earthly life can then be made. This judgment is what we're singing about in the in the Diazira. And the author of the Diazire, the church presenting the Diazire to us on the occasion of a Requiem Mass, um, presents to us the idea that when all of our misdeeds are exposed before God, this is indeed a frightening, uh, a frightening, um, uh, a frightening occasion. Uh, when nothing will escape his view and we, we present ourselves with confidence in his mercy, and, um, and, but our, our sins are a source of our uh, fear. Then uh, we, have, we believe also in a general, a general judgment. Why are there two judgments? God has uh, revealed to us that there will be a general judgment, and in the Dia's area we're playing we're praying that please let us not be with the goats on the left, but please let us be included with the sheep on the right, on the right side, uh, as is made clear in the 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel. The, the general judgment is necessary because there are effects to our life. Uh, there are effects to our life that will go on beyond our life. And um, good things that we have done will ripple with good effects as time goes on, even beyond the good that we've done. But also the evil that we have chosen will ripple out and cause other evils to happen too. So therefore, we are in some measure responsible for the good that happens due to the good that we have done, or the evil that will happen due to the evil that we have done. And so therefore, our effect on society, both ecclesiastical and civil, is something that we are, we are responsible for too. And so therefore, in the general judgment, all will be revealed to all, not only as individuals, but also as, as, our, as a society. But our Lord has defined the criteria upon which we will be judged. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. Lord, when did we see you hungry? Insofar as you did this to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Insofar as you did not this to the least of my brethren, you did not do it to me. And based on that, there is either reward or punishment. So the criteria is really not hard to, it's, uh, it's not hard to understand, is it? It's fairly straightforward. But all of them are surprised, aren't they, when the general judgment is described? Both are surprised. Lord, when did we see you hungry? Both the sheep say that and the goats say that. Lord, when did we see you hungry? And thirsty and, and a stranger and in prison and sick, etc. When did we see you? So while the the issue of the general judgment, we are not going to be judged on technicalities. We're not going to be judged on complicated, you know, laws. Uh, the, the, the rule and the law, the criteria upon our judgment is very straightforward. But the application of that perhaps is 
even more straightforward than we would like to believe. Sometimes we want a little complication to find wiggle room and loopholes. Lord, when did we see you hungry? Basically, you saw me hungry and thirsty and naked and a stranger and in prison and sick all the time. Always. In everyone. Especially the least. You should have seen me everywhere. There's no technicalities. There are no loopholes. There's no, there's no day off either. There's no wiggle room. It's very straightforward. It's direct. It's as sharp as a knife, we might say, but it applies to everything. Lord, when did we see you? Well, you should have seen me everywhere, even in the least. God love you. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit.